Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out today. And um, welcome to uh, Women at Google. And we're pleased to um, have Greta, Greta Waits here. Um, she's traveling around to a lot of companies in the Bay Area. But she's obviously a very famous women's distance runner. And she's been running competitively for more than 40 years and is now really working to promote health and fitness and um, positive lifestyle changes that you can have while working in the corporate world. Um, so without further ado, Greta. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan, and thank you for having me. You know, it's, uh, it's a great opportunity for me to sort of spread the message about, uh, first of all, the corporate challenge, which uh, you guys won in the men's division last year, and uh, I saw Nathan in New York. And, uh, and the good news about the corporate challenge this year is that uh, it's not only the winning team that is uh, being invited to the championship in New York. It's the five best teams in each category. So the women have a chance, and the COVID team. And uh, I was just told by Nathan that uh, the men's team is pretty strong this year. So you're probably going for the number one position once again. Uh, and uh, you know what I really love about uh, the corporate challenge, except for the championship, where it is sort of like uh, you know the Olympic Games for the corporate world in running. But uh, uh, the race itself, like here in San Francisco, it sort of embraces everybody. You don't have to be you know, super fit. And uh, you can even walk a 3.5 mile race. Or you can run it slowly. You can jog it. You can walk it and run it. I mean, whatever way you want. You can even crawl it on all four if you want. <laughs> you, you don't really have to be you know, very, very in a great shape. Uh, it's sort of the, what the, how the, it started was that they wanted to sort of um, uh, make awareness of uh, physical activity in the workplace. Because uh, in the modern world now, most of the work is done by sitting on your behind at the desk. And uh, what most people do is they sit in the car on the way home. And when they get home, they sit more on their behind, you know, in front of TV or dinner or whatever. So we don't get enough physical exercise. Uh, you know, 50 years ago, a lot of people, they got a lot of physical challenges during their work day because the work was different than it is today. And so did also the kids, because um, when the kids were playing and having fun, they were physically active. Uh, you know, they played in a different way than the kids are playing today. Today, kids play with the computer, the games, TV, whatever, and uh, the same. Uh, thing happens with the kids, that happens with the adult. They get uh, diseases like diabetes, uh, they get uh, obesity, uh, things that, you know, is kind of um, uh, not good for their health. And uh, I see it even in a country like Norway, who used to be kind of known for the fact that people were exercising, they were fit, they used to go hiking. and. Uh, the kids were in great shape. They went skiing in the winters. Now uh, we have the same problems as you have with the kids. Uh, the kids, the average kid in Norway now is a lot heavier than it was 20 years ago. And the physical condition is a lot worse than it was years ago. So now the government is really putting emphasis on physical education in the school. Uh, for many years, it has been kind of not number one priority. Now uh, it's sort of by law that uh, schools should have three hours a week with physical activity for the kids. And uh, that is a big, big step in the right directions, as I think, being an old school teacher. Um, back to running. Uh, I grew up at the time when we were playing. We were running around and uh, being physically active. And uh, we even you know, created competitions like who could run around the block most times. And, uh, uh, you know, we were uh, playing uh, what you call cops and robbers, and uh, I remember, you know, when I when I was sort of one of the robbers, nobody wanted to be the cop because they could never catch me. So I realized very early on that I had this, you know, talent for running, and uh, I really liked it. And uh, I have two older brothers, and uh, my favorite time was the time that I could be with them because the boys were more physically active than the girlfriends that I had. Uh, but my parents, they didn't really like that much. So they wanted me to be sort of more like a girl, you know, not getting dirty, not coming home with my ribbons all over the place. And, uh, you know, uh, 
and they sort of had me start to play the piano when I was six and wanted to do my homework, help mom in the house. You know, I hated that. You know, I just wanted to be outside and I was more like a tomboy. So when I was uh, in my early teenage years and I told them that I really wanted to, to, to do some track and field, running, jumping, and uh, they didn't think that was a good idea at all. And uh, they said, no, you know, that's for your brothers. I mean, you just, you know, do what your girlfriends are doing. And, uh, but I said, you know, I don't like that. You know, I wanted to run, and I want to do the long jump, I want to do the high jump, I want to do the hurdles. And uh, so um, when I joined the track and field club, they were sort of just ignoring it. They thought that by ignoring, you know, what I really liked, you know, I would quit and, uh, you know, behave the way they wanted me to behave. Not that I was kind of, uh, you know, rebellious or anything. I just did it quiet, you know, I went to the club training. In Nor just to explain that in Norway, our system is different from yours. The schools have nothing to do with organized sports. So if you want to do sport in an organized way, you have to join a club. We have what you call the club system, which is supported by the government. So, you know, the, um, we, you, the, we get money from the government to sort of run the club. And uh, so I joined a, a track and field club when I was 13. and. Uh, uh, three or four years later, um, I had uh, come to the level where I competed, uh, you know, on the national level. And uh, when I was um, somewhere between 17 and 18, uh, I was uh, pretty good in the middle distance. And uh, so when I came home and I told my dad that, uh, you know what, I, now I am so good that I have been picked to run on the Norwegian track team. And my father was like, wow, are you that good? And, uh, you know, <laughs> you know he, he didn't really keep pay attention at all. And I said, yes, Dad, you know, I've been training pretty hard. And uh, you've just not been interested and not asked me and not paid attention. And, you know, within a week, he was like telling, very good at telling our neighbors and his colleagues that, <laughs> you know what, Greta is on the Norwegian track team and she's going to to, I think I was going to Sweden, you know, the next week to compete against the Swedish team. And uh, so from ignoring what I was doing, you know, he became, you know, kind of, go Greta, go Greta, way to go, great girl, you know, and, and I finally could quit my piano lessons. <laughs> that was the big victory for me because I really hated it. And uh, so, you know, since then, you know, my parents had really been my biggest fan and uh, whenever I raced in Europe, it like a big championship, the European championship or the world championship cross country, they would go and watch. And uh, if they didn't go and watch, uh, my dad was always very there, but my mom, she was kind of a little nervous on my behalf and uh, she didn't, you know, really want to watch TV, but she was like in the kitchen, how is she doing? How is she doing? You know, she really wanted to know how I was doing, but she didn't have the nerves to sit and watch. It was too exciting for her. So, um, uh, you know, they, um, uh, all through the years, they, they have followed my career. And my dad, uh, he started to make what you call a scrapbook. And uh, I remember the first time it was a big article about me in the paper, you know, the promising Greta, Greta Anderson, that was a maiden name. You know, he went and he bought this big scrapbook. And I said, Dad, you're crazy. You think that I'm going to fill that book with newspaper clippings? And he said, yes, I think that you're going to be really great. And, uh, you know, you, be, you know, just let me do this. And uh, so you do your running, and I gather all the clippings. And, uh, you know, today I have eight of those scrapbooks. And uh, I am very, very grateful that my dad collected everything because, uh, you know, now, so many years after my retirement, it's kind of neat to you know look back and say, "Wow, I did that. I did that. a lot of things that I've forgotten." And uh, so I, I'm I'm really appreciate that he did all the work and uh, make eight very nice scrapbooks for me and collected articles from magazines and newspapers and whatever. And uh, I started out, as you understand, as a track runner, middle distance running, 800, 1500 meters, and. Uh, because that was the longest distance available for women when I was running. Uh, the 10,000 and 5,000 didn't come until in the mid-80s. Mid uh, and at that time, uh, I had already started running marathons. Uh, even in um, the Olympics in LA in 1984, 
the longest distance uh, for women on the track was uh, 3,000 meters, a little shorter than two miles. And then they had the marathon. So for me at that time, it was natural to do the marathon. But the way I kind of switched my career from track to marathon was more or less a coincidence. And uh, uh, I don't know what I would have been doing today if uh, I didn't go to New York in 1978 and ran my first marathon. And I didn't do it because I wanted to run the marathon. I went to New York because I'd never been to the States before. And I'd never been, of course, to New York, which was sort of a very famous city and everybody would like to go. And uh, how it turned out that I went was that uh, it was the end of the track season in 1978. Uh, I felt that I had reached my potential on the track. Uh, um, I don't know if you are familiar with times, but my best 1500 was four flat and I ran, uh, which is equivalent to about 420 mile or 418. And uh, my best uh, 3000 was 831, uh, which is probably equivalent to a little over nine minutes for two miles. So, you know, I was pretty fast and I won the world championship cross country. And, uh, you know, what's amazing with the times that I ran, when I look at the track times, what the women are running these days, I. My times would have been competitive with the women, you know, even after 25 years. So, you know, at the time I took it for granted that I was so fast. But now, you know, I'm more proud now of what I did, you know, 20 years ago. So, um, but anyway, you know, and uh, at the time running was not a professional sport. I was working full time as a school teacher. And uh, I married uh, in 1975 with... Um, uh, my coach, who then turned out to be manager, and he took care of everything. His name is Jack, and uh, even I would kill him after he talked me into run my first marathon. We are still married, and uh, <laughs> because he he was talking me into, and I was talking about retire from competitive running back in '78. Uh, um, he said that you know. I think you can really run a good marathon. And uh, at the time, I was like, a marathon? You know, isn't that very far? And he said, yes, it is. It is 26 miles. And uh, I said, are you crazy? Do you think, you know, you know, I'm a middle distance runner. How can I run a marathon? And he said, you know, I run with you. I train with you. I know that the better you, the longer you run, the better you are. And uh, so I really think we should give this a shot. And uh, wouldn't it be nice to go to New York? And I said, of course, you know, but who's going to pay? You know, I'm, and, you know, I was a school teacher, and um, you know we, we couldn't really afford to travel to New York, stay there for almost a week. And uh, so he said, "Well, I'm going to call the New York Roadrunners, who, who organized the New York City Marathon, and ask them if they can invite us." And uh, you know, he called, and Fred LeBeau, who is sort of the guy who invented the big city New marathons, the New York City Marathon. Uh, he is not at the office that day, so his secretary is the one who picks up the phone and, uh, you know, she's like, Greta who? You know, she doesn't follow track and field at all and she had no idea who I am. And my husband says, well, you know, she's one of the best middle distance runners in the world. She won the world championship cross country this spring and, uh, you know, I think she can, you know, be really competitive in the marathon. Yeah, well, what's her PR in the marathon? Well you know, she hasn't run one, but uh, so she kind of just hung up the phone, but she wrote down my name on the piece of paper, and uh, I think that little piece of paper is the reason why I'm here today, because uh, what happened was that Fred LeBeau, the following day, he comes into the office, and he sees my name on this piece of paper, and he know me from my track times and cross country, and uh, he says, you know, uh, why is Greta Waite's name here? And uh, the secretary tells him the story and uh, he said, well, I don't know. I don't think she can finish the marathon because she's a middle distance runner, but she's very fast and she can, will probably be a good pace setter like a rabbit for the women's field. Like I would set the pace and they would follow me and then you know, I would kind of help them to a good time because he, he was expecting me to drop out. Uh, so he said, well, and she's from Norway, that will be in some kind of an international flavor to the women's field. And so, yeah, you know, we kind of, it's a good investment. That's also how he looked at it. So he decided that uh, he would pay our expenses. And this is like four weeks before the marathon, after the track season. And uh, the longest run I've ever run is like 11 miles. And, um, but, uh, you know, running 11 miles, that is in one session, I would probably the same day have done like six miles in the morning because 
At the time, I was running about 85 to 95 miles a week, and I was training twice a day. So I was used to do a lot of mileage, but I haven't done the specific marathon training. And uh, so, you know, and with three weeks to go, I mean, it's not that much time to train for, for the marathon. So I just decided to, to go with my track background. And uh, we come to New York three days before the event, and uh, you know, to tell the truth, I didn't care about the marathon at all. I was so excited about being in New York, and we went to Broadway and the Empire State Building, and you know, all the things you do when you come to New York. And uh, I love to go to Macy's and the shops and everything. And uh, uh, and my husband was like, "Don't you really want to go over the course?" And I said, "No." No, who cares? You know, uh, you know, I had no idea what I was doing, and uh, also, this is 1978. Today, when you go to a bookstore, you see like four shelves with books: how to run the marathon, how to train, what to eat, what to do, how to stretch, how to do this, how to do that, what to wear. In those days, there was was almost nothing, and I didn't know anything. I, the word carbo loading, I'd never heard it before, and uh, being hydrated. Nothing that really I was paying attention to because I was a track runner. You know, you don't you run just for four to eight minutes. Who needs to be hydrated? And uh, and in Norwegian, you know, I, you know, I, I didn't know anything about it. And um, my husband and I, we were in New York to kind of celebrate the fact that I was maybe going to retire and the fact that we were in New York for the first and the last time in our life. So. The day before the race, when everybody was going to bed early and carbo load, we went to a very nice restaurant, ate all the wrong food, shrimp cocktail for an appetizer, filet mignon as the main course, which is sort of not what you're supposed to eat before the marathon. And uh, I got my carbs in a baked potato, and uh, then ice cream, and then we had a bottle of red wine, which is sort of what you're not to do. Uh, but uh, you know, after that, I said, you know, it doesn't matter what you eat because, you know, I won the next day. But anyway, uh, the, the, uh, how it, uh, the race itself was kind of a story, uh, a f story that uh, I will always remember. First of all, this is the first time in my life that I run a race with more than 10 people on the starting line. I come out to the Staten Island where the starting area is. And in 1978, there were about 13,000, 14,000 people. And uh, you know, I'm like walking around there and looking at all these people, all age and all ages, shapes and sizes. And uh, some of them could really lose 10 pounds or more. You know, they didn't look like runners at all. And uh, I was like asking myself, are all these people running 26 miles? You know, they don't look like runners and they don't look like athletes. And uh, some of them, you know, could have been my parents. You know, I'm kind of never been in a mass participation like that because. The jogging boom had not reached Europe and Scandinavia at that time. So the people who, run, who ran in Norway at the time were you know, people like myself, more or less serious athletes. The average person, you know, they went hiking. They didn't really run. And uh, so um, you know, I was just amazed by you know, the whole thing that I saw there. And uh, this plan, how I should run the race, was sort of just to run with the other female as long as I could. That was what my husband told me, who were back at the finish line in Central Park waiting for me. And so I said, well, that sounds easy. And uh, he said, but just, you know, you have to hold back because the pace is going to feel kind of slow for you compared to what I'm used to as a middle distance runner. And he was very, very right because I felt like I was on a training tour, training run for the first uh, 10 miles. It felt so easy. You know, we were passing five miles and I was, you know, feeling like piece of cake, what is this big deal about marathon if they're not going to run faster than we are doing now? We passed 10 miles, I still felt great. We passed 15 miles, I felt like on top of the world and uh, we are like approaching Manhattan, running over Queensboro Bridge, which is sort of an incline and I'm pretty strong, you know, running hills, growing up in Norway. So at that time, you know, I had no idea where I was on the course and uh, but uh, because the, the course was marked with miles, and I'm sort of a kilometer person, and I couldn't really convert, you know. But, you know, I thought that, you know, I've been running for quite a while, so the finish line can't be that far away. And, you know, so I, you know, took the lead, and I was the first female runner who comes out on First Avenue. And uh, on the bridge, there is no spectators. They are not allowed. So there are a lot of people, you know, all the way up First Avenue. and. 
it's my first road race ever and I never experienced anything and people in New York you know they are kind of crazy and they were screaming and yelling and you know they didn't know who I was but they were just so excited about the first female is coming and they were cheering and I felt like you know running downhill with a tailwind that and I was like flying down the first avenue for three or four miles and then within a quarter mile I stopped flying that was when I it was around 21 mile mark. I felt that what is happening here? You know, my body, this is not something that I have experienced before. I was entering unknown territory. <laughs> and uh, within, it's, it's kind of, I don't know if any here has run a marathon, but you, one moment you feel great and within a quarter mile, you don't feel so good anymore. And that was what happened to me. I felt like within two blocks, Somebody gave me a backpack and a pair of boots and a big winter coat and just told me, keep on running. And uh, I was like, my God, where is Central Park? You know, it's, uh, uh, I was in pain and my thighs were started to cramp up. I started to, because I, it was a combination of lack of long runs and dehydration. Uh, I had never ran and, uh, I'd never run and you know, been drinking at the same time. And also in those days, there were no bottles and no, what do you call this energy goo, gel things. You know, they, they had just water. And uh, so I was, you know, taking these paper cups and when you are running and you grab a paper cup, of course, half of it goes out. And then you try to drink and then I got it in my nose and all over the face and I said, what the heck, forget that. And I just, you know, put my head down and said, you know, it, Central Park has to be you know, pretty close because I've been out there for ages. And uh, I was kind of, there were guys running on both sides of me. And um, later I was told, oh, they were there because they just wanted to be on TV. You were the first woman, you know, I thought they were kind of trying to help me. But, <laughs> uh, and then, uh, you know, I, I was kind of a little uncomfortable speaking English. So, uh, you know, I was thinking, you know, I need to know how far is the finish line because this is getting to be pretty bad and uh, I said kind of how far to the finish and he said well I think it is about four miles and I said four miles what is four miles you know I know it's more than four kilometers but uh, you know it's uh, I was too tired to try to convert this and um, so I just put my head down and finally we get to Central Park and but when you get there you still have three miles to go and those miles are like rolling hills my thighs were aching my calves were cramping I had blisters and I was like, I'm going to kill my husband when I see him. <laughs> because he was sort of responsible for me being here. He was there. We had a nice dinner the day before. I was paying the price by really suffering out here, running the marathon. And uh, the fact that I was, uh, you know, the first woman, uh, I didn't even think about it. Because, you know, I was used to win most of my races. So for me, just to, to win, for me, at when I was running there, I thought, you know, it is just like winning another race. And little did I know that when I come into the park from Columbus Circle, uh, the fact that I entered so, so late, I wasn't even in the program. Nobody knew who I was. And uh, the announcer, uh, he, he just know that uh, he has heard on the phone that 1173 is the first woman. And because my number was made with a Sharpie, uh, you know, that normally the, the best woman they have one, two, three, and four, but my number was 1173. And uh, he was like, the first woman is entering the park and it's going to be a new world record. Two th she's going to, to break the old record with more than two minutes. She's going to run a 232 marathon. Wow, this is so great. But who is that blonde with the pigtails? And, <laughs> you know, <coughs> and he didn't even know my name. And um, so I, I, I crossed the finish line. And everybody, you know, when New Yorkers get excited, they really get excited. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, so I crossed the finish line. I'm so happy that, you know, I'm relieved the pain is over. And I just, I see my husband at the end of the shoots and I'm like, you know, I'm gonna kill you, <laughs> just wait. And, but then before I get there, you know, the media capital of the world, that's New York City. You have TV cameras, radios, I get all these microphones ahead of me and I like, and they want to, I mean, they're all asking questions and I'm like, you know, I don't speak English. I just keep on walking and I see my husband and I'm so angry, I'm so tired. And uh, 
I'm saying a lot of things that I won't repeat in English because I don't think I know the words, they were so bad. Uh, but I was speaking Norwegian so nobody knew what I was saying. But what I, you know, basically I told him I never want to run a marathon again. I just want to get out of here and I'm hurting, I'm in pain, I'm tired and uh, I took off my shoes and I, I lit literally threw my shoes at him and I, you know, I was so mad. And he was like, Greta, you have won a big race, you have set the world record. And I was like, I don't care, I just want to go home. <laughs> and, you know, and uh, I was a school teacher, so um, I need to get a plane at 8 p.m. that the same night uh, because I hadn't organized for a substitute, substitute teacher the following day. When I left for New York, I had no idea that I would win the race and set the world record, you know, so. Uh, so when the organizer kind of hear that, you know, she's leaving tonight, they get kind of a little bit upset because it is a big award ceremony when you win the New York City Marathon and, uh, uh, and the winners, they are always either on the Today Show and the Good Morning America. And, uh, they, say, and they are telling me, you know, you, you can't really leave because you have to be at the award ceremony and also tomorrow morning there is a limo to pick you up and take you to the Good Morning America. You know, I have no idea what Good Morning America is. And they say, no, I don't care, you know, I can't, you know, I have to go home and no, and you know, and so what, how it all ends up is that they ask me where my, um, what school I'm teaching at. They figure out, uh, and I give them the name of the principal. They call, you know, you know, some of these phone companies that, you know, trace people. They call my principal. And uh, they say that, well, Greta, one of your teachers, she has won the New York City Marathon and set the world record, but, uh, and she really needs an extra day off from work. And uh, <laughs> so uh, the principal, he was a little bit kind of taken getting this phone call. And uh, I think if they have asked if I could get a week off, he would have said yes. But uh, I got an extra day off, so I did the award ceremony and uh, the, the Good Morning America. Or, and uh, later, of course, I realized that it's a big deal being on that TV and that people kind of apply for that, you know, way in advance. And uh, but anyway, you know, I left New York and I said, you know, never again am I going to run a marathon. But uh, as you all know, time heals old source, what they or whatever they say, and. Uh, I do my track season in 1979 and, you know, I had, had a great season and then, you know, when fall comes around, we get this phone call from New York that uh, he really wants me back and he, you did so great last year and it would mean a lot to us as an organizer to have, you know, the world record holder coming back to defend her title and I'm like, do I really want to do that once again? And my husband who said, Greta, you know, he, he knew exactly which button to press and, uh, you know, he said, you know, think about it, you know, you, you set a world record, you won the race, you didn't even train for it. I mean, you did it with your track training. And now, we, now it's like August and we can incorporate some long runs a little earlier so you are better prepared. And, uh, you know, he was telling me how great I was, you know, and I was like, okay, give me more, I like this, you know, and, you know. So, <laughs> Well, finally, I said, yes, yes, I'll do it. Uh, but you just have to put, incorporate all these long runs. I did my long runs. I went back to New York in 79. I improved my time with five minutes. I ran a 2.27 and was the first woman to break 2.30 in the marathon, which was a big deal. I was even on the, the editorial in, you know, the New York Times wrote about it. And uh, so that was a big deal. And uh, I realized that, you know, doing break setting world records and winning the New York City Marathon really is a big deal. And uh, so I left back sort of not so resistant against, you know, running marathons. And uh, I came back then in 1980 and I was still working full time as a school teacher, running twice a day, at that time running about 90 to 100 miles a week. So it was a very, very tough for me to, to be competitive at that level with my full time job. and. Uh, so I ran a 2.25 in 1980 and set another world record. And uh, then what sort of kept me in the sport was that at the same time in 1981, they opened it up to, to accept prize money without being disqualified. And uh, they opened it up to have a sponsor. So it was possible for me to quit my job as a teacher and uh, be a full-time runner. And uh, for me, that was the best that could ever happen. Uh, I loved running. And uh, I thought I was very, very fortunate and privileged, could have my passion, my desire, 
as a job and get paid very well for it, much more than I earned as a school teacher. So uh, uh, I stayed in the sport for 10 more years that I didn't really plan on. In the beginning, I ran 10 years of track from 1970 to 80, and then I consider myself a marathoner, you know, from 1980 until I ran my last competitive race in 1990. And um, I won uh, the New York City Marathon nine times. Uh, I know that uh, Fred Lebeau, he really wanted me to win ten times, and uh, I tried in 1990, but um, I, was, I knew I was sort of at the end of my career. I was 37 years old, and I'd been running, you know, for a long, long time, and uh, I was getting more injuries. Uh, I, had, I was sidelined from running more often than earlier, so I kind of realized that this is maybe the time for me to retire. And uh, in 1990, I was uh, number four, and I took that as a sign that, uh, you know, it's time to quit uh, competitive running. And um, I, it took a while for me to make, to, to think about it. I started training in 1991 as I was going to have a competitive season. But then um, I remember it, uh, I, I told Jack, my husband, that uh, it's not April Fool, but it was 1st of April, and I told him that today you can send out a press release that I'm retiring from competitive running. And uh, so I knew that I was making the right decision. I never regretted it. I, uh, I looking back, I had a great season, uh, a great career, and um, when I retired, I felt that I kept the best of the running. I left the things that I didn't like behind me. I left the pressure, the expectations, uh, the workouts that I didn't like, you know, the hard workouts going on the track and my husband timing me, you know, and I felt that I had to perform and I kept, you know, the runs that I enjoyed, the easy runs that you can go out and just enjoy it, relax, don't have to think about times and uh, uh, I kept my contract with uh, Adidas or Adidas and uh, they kept me busy going to races and uh, I stayed in the running community and I also could spend more time with the corporate challenge. Um, I got involved with them in the mid 80s uh, by winning the New York City Marathon so many times and the bank being the sponsor of the race they approached me told me about the event and uh, how they really wanted to increase uh, awareness of fitness within the working environment. And, uh, you know, I really liked the idea. I liked the concept of the race, the fact that it was a team competition and uh, that the, the, you know, you did something together with your coworkers outside the office. And also the fact that the event is very social. Uh, I don't know um, how many people you had in last year's corporate challenge. 30, yeah. Yeah, well, well, with all these people, you should have 200. I mean, <laughs> because it is an event that, as I said, embraces everybody. And uh, yeah, I really like it. And uh, I was up in Rochester three weeks ago, and uh, they had more than 10,000 people running. And uh, they had about 5,000 people who just walked the race. So it's, you know, it embraces everybody. And uh, I just, you know, would love to see more people, you know, from a big company like this coming out in September. And you have plenty of time to get ready. And if you want to try to run it, uh, there is uh, a nine-week training program on the website, JP Morgan Chase CC, that I have designed for, um, you know, everybody who, from even if you want to run it, jog it, walk it, or whatever, it, you can sort of make your own adjustments. And uh, there is also a lot of column that I have written about, um, you know, health and fitness and uh, the benefits. And um, uh, when I talk about the benefits, uh, we all know that uh, we should eat healthy and exercise and that sort of prevent us or reduces the risk to get sick. And uh, uh, I have thought that the way I live that, you know, I would, you know, stay healthy for the rest of my life because, you know, I've been eating right and I've been running and then, Two years ago when I was, the doctor told me I was diagnosed with cancer, you know, I was kind of, the roof caved in. And uh, I said, how can I get cancer? You know, I have no cancer in my family and I've been doing all the right things. And he said, you know, sometimes it's just bad luck. And, um, uh, but what is on your side in this situation is that you are very, very fit. You are in good shape and uh, 
what you are going to go through, uh, your condition would really be a big help to you. And uh, he, was, he was very, very right. I had had surgeries, radiation, chemo. I'm still not out of the woods, uh, so I'm still having treatments. But, uh, you know, I have a very good quality of life because I'm still exercising uh, every day. Even the days I have chemo, I'm able to sort of work out and, you know, do what I normally do. Uh, it wasn't always so because uh, I was a couch potato for four weeks only. <laughs> and um, the reason for that was that when you get, you know, a message like you have cancer, you get depressed and like most people you think that I'm going to die like next week, next month, next year. And uh, so, and I had my surgery, I started chemo, I was so depressed and I was, you know, I didn't want to do anything and uh, I felt sorry for myself. I was there on the couch. I didn't feel that I could do anything. I was tired and you know, the less you do, the more tired you feel. And I think that I was sort of in that bad circle. And uh, I was there in June 2005, feeling sorry for myself, thinking that today I should have been in New York City for the corporate challenge they have in Central Park. And uh, here I am on the couch, you know, feeling sorry for myself and uh, I don't do anything. And, uh, and, I, and then it, I was kind of pulling myself together and I said, you know, this is not me and uh, I'm gonna do the corporate challenge. And this was in the afternoon and uh, I have a treadmill in the house. So I take off my slippers, at least I did that. I didn't know if I could, I, I had no plans of running 3.5 miles. I just wanted to see if I could walk it. So uh, I just put on my running shoes and uh, I am wearing my jeans, you know, a shirt and a sweater and uh, I put on the treadmill and I start out walking very, very slowly because I'm a little bit you know, insecure, don't know if it is good for me to do this or how I would feel and how it would have an impact, you know, on my treatments and, you know, my situation. But, you know, after a mile I feel pretty good and I increase the pace and uh, put on a little incline and I get, I take off the sweater because I'm starting to get warm and I, after two miles, you know, I said, you know, uh, you know, I'm very competitive and it's like, you know, I, I can go faster and I put on more incline, speed up. I get even warm, I take off my jeans, I'm just walking in my underwear, and then, you know, I'm passing, you know, two and a half miles, and I'm looking at the clock, the display, you know, let's see if I can break an hour, and I'm kind of walking faster, and uh, then, you know, I do the 3.5 mile in 55 minutes or so, and, uh, you know, it's not a big athletic performance, but for me, in that situation, that was like a big, big victory, and I was so excited, I felt so good about myself, I felt that I can, you know, when I can do this, I can do more and I can do anything. And my husband comes back home later and I told him, oh, Jack, Jack, you know, I did the corporate challenge. And he was like, what? I did the corporate challenge. And he, what are you talking about? And I said, you know, I did 3.5 miles on the treadmill and, to, and it, I, I feel so good and tomorrow I'm going to do four and then I'm going to do four and a half. I was so excited, you know, it, and my, he was like, take it easy, you know, one, one step at a time, you know, we're going to plan this and, um, you can be on the treadmill every day, but you had just have to take it step by step. And that was how I did. I walked further and faster. And then after three weeks, you know, I'm, you know, feeling pretty good about myself. And uh, I'm sitting, you know, doing some work on the computer. And then it got bling, you got mail. And I'm like, who's sending an email? And I got an email from Lance Armstrong. And I'm like, my goodness. And I'm like, Lance Armstrong? <laughs> you know, how, how, how does... He, you know, I, I never met him, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I don't know him, and how does he know my email address? And uh, he knows that I'm sick, and, you know, and he's writing like, you know, I'm sorry to hear the news that you have cancer, and uh, I know what you're going through, but you are an athlete like I am, and you are also a big fighter like I am. I know you are a great runner. I've been following your career, and uh, I started out as a runner, and uh, he said, you know, I know that uh, he, cancer is a shitty disease, that's his words. And, uh, you know, but like me, you're going to beat this shit, so stay strong. And, you know, he really encouraged me. And I'm like, wow. And the next day, you know, I got and get his book, his um, biography. It's not only about the bike. And I read about, you know, how he reacted to his, you know, cancer thing. And uh, in his book, he, he writes about um, how he was undergoing chemo. He felt lousy, but he still 
every morning he walked out the uh, steep hill outside his house in Texas, and um, I was kind of inspired by that. So I put my in my treadmill on a 7% incline, imagine I was Lance Armstrong walking up that hill. <laughs> and um, so, you know, he sort of inspired me and he sent me several emails later, you know, checking in to see how I was doing and encouraging me. And I told him that, you know, I was now just before I could start running on my treadmill. And, uh, and you know, I started running and I exercised every day. And I got to meet Lance in, um, Lance in New York uh, last fall when he ran the New York City Marathon. And he is just an incredible guy, very, very down to earth, very, very nice. And uh, he still keeps in touch. And uh, when he had his uh, 10 years anniversary party from being cancer free, uh, he invited me to come to his to his house, but unfortunately, I just returned from the States and I really couldn't jump on a plane and go to Texas again. You know, it's kind of, it's not like taking a bus, you know, across the town and going from Oslo to Texas. So I had to, you know, tell him that I would really love to be there, but I'm sorry, it, I, I can't really come. So, but uh, I will see him in New York again this fall, and uh, so I'm excited about that. And um, so, you know, that's uh, really given me a good quality of life and uh, exercise now is very important to me and even more important than ever before and uh, I just want to share that experience with you and encourage you to you know keep exercising stay healthy and uh, and you don't have to run a marathon I mean walking jogging biking whatever just find something that you know keeps your heart rate up a little bit break a sweat and uh, keep it try to sort of keep it into your lifestyle so it's something not it's not something you do for a short period of time but that you can you know do it as long as you live that is sort of my ambition and uh, it makes me feel good and um, I just want to open it up for some question and answering you know about whatever you would like to know about training nutrition about me whatever First, can I <laughs> Is this on? Okay. Before that, we do q and I just want to take a second, and since I know it's very hard for athletes to sometimes um, go through it themselves, I'd like to read off some of your, 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 your best times. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> so I think I have them here. You can Google me. <laughs> yeah, they're in. Yeah. That's you true. Know, uh, can I, I have to tell you a funny story about you know, Googling uh, since you work in the company. Uh, you know, I, I go back and forth between Norway and the States uh, plenty of times, and uh, you have to go through immigration. And uh, some, you know, my experience is that female officers they are more sort of putting you in the hot seat than male are. And she was like, you know, you travel so much back and forth. What are you doing? And I was like telling her, you know, uh, you know, I'm a spokesperson for JP Morgan Chase, and I go to all the events and. Uh, we also have a home in Florida, and she was like, you know, uh, what's your social security number? How much money do you make? And I was like, you know, I, I didn't, you know, I felt like, you know, why do you need to know all this? You know, I'm not doing anything legal, and uh, how many days per year do you stay in the States? And I was like, oh, I have no idea. And, uh, and then she sent me into what you call the second room, uh, and I was sitting there with, you know, people with all their things in plastic bags and turbans and all this, you know, I was the only white, pe uh, white person there and I was feeling like I was doing something illegal and finally it's my turn and I go up to the officer and uh, she says, you know, and I tell her, you know, again what I'm doing and she said, well, okay, do wait a minute and then she goes in and she Googles me <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then she comes, comes out and she's like, Wow, what are you doing here? You know, yeah. <laughs> is it really a statue of you? Are, the, do, are you really on the stand? You know, and, and she's like telling everybody in the room who I am, and I'm like, oh please, you know. Uh, but you know, she just stamped my passport and said, you can go. <laughs> but that's kind of funny, you know. That was googling. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> well, just to just to run through the the biography that I have, I also just pulled up the one on Google as well, um, but. Greta was the nine-time winner of the New York City Marathon, um, five-time winner of the World Cross Country Championships, the five-time winner of the Women's Mini Marathon in New York City, a gold medalist in the 1993 World Championship Marathon in Helsinki, uh, the silver, silver medalist in the 1984 Olympic Marathon in Los Angeles, 
the first woman to break 2.30, as you said, um, in the marathon, and set four world bests in the event, including the first time she ever ran the distance, um, two-time world record holder in the 3,000 meters. I think that range is just incredible. It's just amazing. Um, and world bests in, in many other racing distances. And let's see, Wikipedia has a bunch more, too. But I'm sure I can find more of a list. But while, we're do, while I'm looking for more personal best times on Greta, um, why don't we take questions? <laughs> From the far corner. You know, uh, when, when I, uh, I don't know if you were when I told the story, I was a track runner and uh, I had no idea I wasn't peaking for anything. You know, I just, I, I just wanted to go to New York. So, you know, I, I didn't even care about the marathon, what time I ran. I had no idea. Uh, it was just that my husband, who was my coach and my manager, he told me that, you know, I could win it. And uh, I said, okay, let's see if I can win it. You know, that's, uh, that's what I was. But, but later, you know, when I was, got more experienced, uh, um, my personal best is 224, which is about the 520 pace per marathon. So, uh, but, but, you know, when I ran my marathons, I, I never ran for time. I always ran for the victory because I, my thinking was that a time is always you know, numbers on a piece of paper and there will come other runners who are going to break your time or improve your time, but nobody can knock on my door and take my, vict my medal away from me. So I always ran for the victory. And uh, when I later ran my marathons, I was always very often running even pace or negative splits, which negative splits, which means that you run the second half a little faster than the first one. And uh, that is the way most elite marathoners run their marathons. If you look at the world best times in the marathons, they are basically achieved by an even pace or uh, negative splits. Wow. <laughs> That's the younger version. That's the pigtails. <laughs> Any other questions up front? How do you um, how do you deal with the frustration of being injured? Like you said, as you get older, you getting more injuries, and you know you, you have races in mind that are coming up. Yeah. And you get injured, and you want to you know you got to take time off, but you really don't want to because you know you're getting further out. Of yeah, but, but that that is a very good question, and uh, I if I could go back and do my career all over again. The number one thing I would have done is not ignore the little signals that my body is trying to tell me that something is wrong here. Because I was ignoring the little aches and pains and then they got more aches and pains, but I was like, I can still run, so I run. Until I had to throw in the towel and said, well, I think I have to cross train because now I can't run. If I had backed off at an earlier stage, I would not have had the injuries that I had. So that is. I know it's hard because you know sometimes you, you have some aches and pains and you, it disappears after a mile or so, and uh, you think that's going to happen every time, but sometimes it don't go away and it turns out to be you know a serious injury. So uh, you know, stretching, strengthening, and uh, listen. Don't ignore those uh, minor aches and pains. And even if you have to miss the race, you know I'm, I had to miss like the World Championship once and the European Championship once because I was stupid. I was kind of so mindset that I have to train because it is the World Championship and uh, I ended up, when the World Championship won, I was doing running in, in the pool <laughs> because I couldn't uh, compete. So that's the number one thing that I regret, that I was kind of too stubborn and didn't listen to you know the signals. Did that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. I don't know, yeah. You were a school teacher and training a lot of miles. When would you, would you run morning and evening? Or how both, both yes. I had to get up like 5.30 and because I had, to, I had a long commute to the school where I worked, where I was teaching. So I had to get up at 4.30 4 and I had to do my training between 5 and 6 in the morning. And uh, thank God I, I have a very, very nice husband who would get up with me and do the morning runs with me. And uh, my two brothers, uh, they were also runners, and I would run with them in the afternoon. And uh, one of them was uh, like faster, 
So I would do like, when I was doing like uh, 10 times uh, or 20 times a quarter, I would run with him. If I was doing like uh, six or seven times a mile, I would use my older brother. So, you know, I could kind of look at my training as call up my, you know, I'm going on the track and do 10 times a quarter, can you run with me? <laughs> so I always had, you know, somebody close that I could run with. And I'm very grateful for that. Well, I got to run one marathon in my life. And one thing that really stuck with me was that the training led up to the marathon that we didn't ever run 26 miles until the day of the marathon. Our last run was 22 miles. And they said that that was a, a motivational thing so that when you actually ran the 26, it would really feel like an accomplishment. And I was wondering what you thought of that as a training. Method. You know, that, that's a very good question because a lot of people ask me about when I ran, you know, competitively, if I ran 26 miles in training, I never did that. Because, uh, you know, if you do it in training, I mean, what's the big deal? Then you know you, then you, know you can do it. And uh, I always say if you can do 20 miles in training in a training week without tapering, without being sort of excited and uh, rested and having the race atmosphere around you, you can definitely do the last six miles in, in the race. And uh, so I, I am not, I never ran more than 21 miles, um, you know, uh, but I, I would do that like more than once, but I, but I never ran longer than that in training. So uh, that's, and I know that most of the elite runners, except from some of the Africans who runs like hundreds of miles, but uh, I, I, they are created differently than the rest of us. But mo most elite marathoners, they, they never run more than 20, 21 miles. Yeah, and you. It is, you know, yeah, you know, uh, the, I think the longer you distance you run, the more mental thing it is. And uh, you, you, because uh, when you are, like when I was a middle distance runner, you know, it, everything happens so quickly. You really doesn't have time to think that much. But in the marathon, uh, you have to stay focused and be concentrated. And that takes a little bit of training and discipline. And uh, what helped me a lot was that I didn't sort of meditate, but I used this visualization, sort of seeing myself running the marathon. And when I was doing my long run, I was thinking about the marathon and uh, also telling myself that I can do it because it is a lot of willpower and that is something you, you can train yourself to. So it is a bit, very, very mental thing the longer you run, that's for sure. So hold for one sec. We're going to take one or two more questions and then um, we're going to have a little raffle and also Gary um, Gary's going to be running that for one of Greta's books um, which you've seen flashed up here and then um, Greta's also going to be around to, to do some autographs for you guys. Um, I don't know if you have the, the picture um, of We've got more too. Right, there's yeah. more back there in a stack but um, so stick so around. You, you pick the person who I'm So two, two, more two more questions. If there's questions. A, two quick questions. Let's do Uh, in terms of how to run the marathon, or you know, uh, first of all, it's important that you do your homework to sort of do the ne the necessary mileage, and the backbone of the marathon training is the long runs. That uh, I mean, you are going to run 26 miles in one day, so you have to make sure that uh, you know your weekly mileage is. When you are kind of topping your mileage, it is about uh, I would say. 45, that's sort of the minimum. And uh, make sure that y you do at least two long runs, uh, 18 to 20 miles. And also on race day, that uh, you, and also on, you know, for first time marathoners, uh, I, if they are unsure if they can do the distance, I tell them, you know, to start walking a little bit early on in the race like maybe run for three miles, walk a minute, run for another three miles and walk a minute. Uh, my sister-in-law, she was 54, she ran her first New York City Marathon last year, last year and she is not really a runner. She is like, she likes to go for walks, she's been hiking, going to the health club on the Stairmaster and all those kind of things, but then she decided that she wanted to run the marathon. 
and she wanted to do New York. And uh, she, already from the start, she ran a mile, she walked a minute, she ran a mile, she walked a minute, but I mean, she walked fast when she was walking. She did it in four hours and 22 minutes. And so, you know, and the reason why it works so well is that when you have those walking breaks before you need them, you are fresh, you know, through the whole race. So that's sort of uh, one way to approach it. Don't drink wine before. Yeah, well, you know, you know that, that's a good question. You know, because uh, if, you, if you don't drink wine normally, don't do it. But I mean, if, if you, I mean, if you, if it is kind of normal for you to have a glass of wine with dinner, it wouldn't make a difference or not. It all depends on what you are used to. I mean, to make major changes in your lifestyle would not have an impact on your performance. In the back. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I just had um, a quick question. Um, I, what advice do you have in terms of kind of overcoming those mental hurdles um, when you're coming back from injuries or illness and things like that um, that have kind of kept you from running? Um, you know, to get back out there, it's kind of scary at first. Um, and I don't, I mean, I, I know like I told my ACL a couple years when I still haven't gone back to training the way I used to um, before I got hurt. Well, and I just didn't know if you had any advice on that. Well, first of all, you, you have to take it step by step. You can't continue where you stopped before your injury. And uh, what I did when I uh, you know, came back from an injury, I always walked a lot before I started running. And then I walked and ran. Now I, I walked uh, and ran and walked and ran. And uh, I, I, I had to sort of start slowly. I, I used about at least two weeks to get back into the running again, to, to not to hurt myself again. You just have to take take it step by step, and uh, that sort of. And but but today there are so many other things you can do. To you know, you can use the elliptical, you can use the stationary bike, you can do the aqua running. There are so many other things to sort of keep you fit also instead of running. And it it all depends on also what kind of injuries you have. I'm sorry, we're running short of time. So we're going to pull. Uh, first, we have three T-shirts, and there, we have a small, medium, and large, and they are all ladies. I'm sorry, we're out of men. So if a man wins, maybe you can give it to a wife, girlfriend, or friend of yours. Christine Weisman. Yeah. Great. Do you want small, medium, or large, Kristen? Stanley, go. Go, Stanley. Can I see the... Is it Stanley? Yeah. This large. And uh, Debbie... So there's a large and a small. Turn them. I don't want to. Okay. Well, I don't know who, who these people and are. And you get so. the large. And uh, the lucky winner of the book is uh, Carolina. Carolina. Platt. Huh? Yeah. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. Great. Okay. Greta, we're going to sit you up right over at this table over here, and she'll sign your book. Thank you.